Good morning. Thank you for having me here. And I, I also want to say um, thank you to the humanist community in general who have, um, over the last several years, um, uh, uh, welcomed students from my Atheism in America class and my Exploring Living Religion class to hang out with you all from time to time. And they've learned much from you. Um, so I, I changed the title uh, of the talk, um, uh, and you'll maybe see a little bit why. Um, um, but I've been looking for the last several years at what, um, what is happening with religion in America. Um, several years ago, um, in the, uh, I guess, 2005, 2006, and 7, um, after I finished my PhD, I was working in an Episcopal seminary, and all this new data I'm sort of culturally an Episcopalian and functionally a skeptic. Um, and those two things very often go together. Um, anyway, so I was working in an Episcopal seminary. All this new data came out about, at that time, the very first uh, American uh, Religious Identification Survey and um, some data from Pew identifying this big leap in people who identified as religiously unaffiliated, people who, who at, answered none when asked with what religion they identified or were affiliated. Big job, drop. So for, you know, most of um, the previous 50 or 60 years, about maybe 7 to 9 percent of the U.S. population identified as religiously unaffiliated. And um, in these early studies, that jumped up to about 15 percent. And people were like, what the what? Shut the door on that. That can't be, right? And so people argued with the data. Um, religious people uh, tended to say, it's not a thing, don't worry about it, they'll get married, they'll have kids, they'll come back. No, that wasn't happening. Non-religious people tended to say, what? We knew, <laughs> right? We knew. And maybe there's more. Um, and that, that proved to be true. Um, so we've seen religious unaffiliated affiliation um, grow substantially um, in the last five years. Um, probably not, I'm going to suggest, because people are becoming less religious, but because they're articulating a certain sense of uh, of their, what we would call their spirituality more broadly in ways that no longer are packaged um, in religious containers. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So um, I usually, I'm not a, um, a, an evolutionary biologist by training, um, but, um, or, or anthropologist, but I usually start um, some of my classes, especially the atheism one, with um, some really interesting data that came from some evolutionary anthropologists uh, a few years ago that was really controversial. So they uh, identified a bunch of, they were studying a bunch of tribes of chimpanzees in different parts of Africa. And chimpanzee tribes, you may know if you've watched Jane Goodall or anything like that, have their own cultures. You know, they have certain practices that they, ch that they share. Um, some of them are unique to particular tribes of chimpanzees, um, and then some of them are sort of universal across chimpanzees. So evolutionary biologists try to look at how, how chimpanzees adapt these cultural uh, differences and what they might mean for other primates like humans in terms of what's innate to us. So there's always been this big question, right? This was Darwin's question, right, when he first set sail. You know, is religion a natural thing? How does it fit into the human frame? So what these biologists found was this interesting behavior among these chimpanzees. So they were in, in multiple uh, different groups in different locations without interaction. And that was important because they could see that they weren't influencing each other. Um, so they found that in each of these communities of, of chimpanzees, there were these trees um, 
under which the chimpanzees had piled rocks, cairns of rocks, like we find in uh, early humanoid uh, communities. If you go to the big island of Hawaii and look out on the lava flats, you'll see these cairns, or in the outback of Australia. And scholars have long theorized that these were sort of early proto-religious kind of things, markings of life passages or um, births and deaths, um, things like that. Other scholars, I, I would note, importantly, think they were maybe early math, like counting the community, um, things like that. Nobody's ever been really sure, but it is common that where these cairns were, often religious sites develop. So they found this interesting. And the Cairns didn't seem to have anything to do with protecting the tribe, uh, with uh, cultivating fertility in any way, with preparing um, young chimpanzees for adult behaviors, um, for getting food, anything like that. What they found was that every once in a while, a chimpanzee, sometimes male, sometimes female, uh, sometimes with a young chimpanzee on their back, but not always, so it wasn't a, a developmental activity, would go down to the cairn, just like in the middle of the day, the way you do, uh, pick up a stone, and you'll see this in the bottom, and just heave it at the tree, just heave it at the tree, and then jump ecstatically and scream, right? And the big controversy around this research is that one of the anthropologists um, wrote an, an article in the, in the journal Nature in which she said that it was a proto-spirituality. Um, that it might be a proto-spirituality, and it might suggest that the answer to Darwin's question, is religion natural, was kind of maybe yes. Now you can see that there are lots of controversies around this, like what's spirituality and what's religion, and you know, how does that work? Are you mapping a certain construct onto primate behavior that, you know, doesn't really make sense to them? They could rule out lots of things, like it wasn't a game, um, like um, do porpoises play games with dead dolphins, for example. They, I don't want to hurt any of you, if you have like a dolphin or porpoise tattoo or something like that, you should know that they're jerks. Um, <laughs> um, um, but, um, so you may want to think that through, but they go out and they kill dolphins because they're, they're not prey, they don't eat them, they bounce them, they're bouncy, they like play ball with them, you know, like they throw them back and forth. So they knew it wasn't a game like that, um, and it wasn't doing a lot of other evolutionary work, it wasn't doing bonding in the community, um, it just had this kind of thing about it that they marked as spirituality. Um, so. Again, I'm not an evolutionary anthropologist, but it raises some questions about if, if we grant them their, pers their perspective on this, um, since I don't have any, any basis to argue with it. It raises some questions about what it is we're doing when we're doing religion and spirituality. And part of the shift that I think we're seeing um, speaks to that. So, We've seen this um, increase in um, religious unaffiliation, especially among young adults. When I started teaching at Santa Clara about nine years ago, I always survey my students. Um, you know, Santa Clara is a Catholic university. It's Jesuit, so, you know, ish. Um, but, um, uh, you know, about 30% of my students would say that they were religiously unaffiliated, you know, atheist, agnostic, humanist, nothing, whatever. And that could have just happened the weekend before when they came to campus. Um, but a lot of them said they were conventionally religious, usually Catholic, or something else. By last year, that had more than flipped. 80% of my students said that they were religiously unaffiliated um, in a Catholic university. Again, could have just happened last weekend. Um, you know, my classes start tomorrow. We'll see where it is um, uh, this year. But clearly, um, nuns are outpacing um, all other religious groups, uh, religious categories in terms of growth, 
Um, and so we raise the question, well, what does that mean about whatever these kind of behaviors these primates are doing that may be wired into um, human nature in some way? Like, are they just going away? What happens to them? And, and moreover, you know, we used to say that um, unaffiliation, um, you know, um, heathenism, as the religious like to refer to it, uh, was mostly a, f a function of the coasts, right? Especially um, the Pacific Northwest, right, which was known as the nun zone for a long time. Um, you know, this sort of latte sipping corridors of the United States um, become more and more godless. Certainly the Bay Area, yay, um, right? But what we find is that, that it's happening everywhere, um, everywhere. And in fact, the places that are traditionally the most religious, seen as the most religious, are experiencing the greatest growth, right? Uh, because statistics, right? There's more possibility for growth. So in the Bible Belt, um, for example, in the Deep South, still more people there identify as religious than non-religious, but they have a faster growth rate because there's more opportunity <coughs> Um, for growth there than in California or New York or other places in the country that you'd think of as nun zones. They also are the highest uh, rate of renters, of streamers, of, um, of uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. I don't know what that means. but um, <laughs> So they are losing their religion and watching Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, so there's this shift happening all over the country and the question, you know, when it first came, started to be noticed, the religious were either being uh, alarmed, were heading into godlessness, saw this a little bit down the street, there's apparently an evangelical church around the corner and they were holding up signs, I, I drove past here uh, a little bit too far, and they were holding up signs saying, um, you know, uh, come in this morning to be saved, um, you know, drive past, and be damned. I mean, like, literally. Um, I mean, I was saying a little earlier, I just sort of can't imagine, like, I was going to Costco, and then, you know, decided to save my soul, right? But there, there was that, that kind of alarm, you know, about everything's going to hell in a handbasket, on the one hand, and then the, the non-religious, um, you know, uh, Susan Jacoby wrote a lot about this in the New York Times at the, at the time, you know, were saying, no, we've always secretly, there have been a lot of non-religious um, people, and people are becoming more non-religious. We're gonna give up all this stone throwing at tree nonsense that is, is not part of human nature, but is actually some kind of primitive behavior that we've grown, we've grown past. Um, and, you know, what we see is that it's not quite either one of those things. So, a few years ago, I did a study um, that eventually uh, became the book that was referenced, Choosing Our Religion, and I went across the country. Um, first, I surveyed uh, people um, and asked them, what it was that um, they identified as important in their spiritual lives, what it meant to have a spiritual life, what practices were involved in that. Um, and then I went around the country and I talked with people who identified as religiously unaffiliated. Um, I went, literally went from Maine to Maui. I just want to note that non-religion in Hawaii is incredibly understudied and I am available for any funding that would <laughs> make that a two or three year project. Um, uh, especially in Wailea. But um, anyway, um, so I, I talked to people about that and I saw what lots of researchers are seeing. And that is that what we see as a hard distinction between the religiously affiliated, the people I call sums, they still got some religion, and the religiously unaffiliated is actually much more fluid um, than we've, we've thought. So when you look at, at nuns, you know, a pretty high amount of them say that they believe in some sort of higher power or life force um, 
nuns in my research tended to describe their sense of self-transcendence in a more imminent sense, whereas the religious tend to describe transcendence as pointing to a transcendent being or force, right? But, you know, it's pretty, it's not as far off as you would think. Um, some, uh, close to 30% of the religiously unaffiliated attend some kind of service um, on a regular basis, right? Some people would identify this as a, as a service um, that they attend with their community. Um, and I would note about the religiously affiliated, this is the long American secret about the religiously affiliated, <clears throat> is um, a guy named Ron uh, Hansen several years ago did a study so about 80%, close to 80%, used to be close to 90% of religious people said that they attended services on a regular basis at least once a month. Uh, and so um, Hansen looked at church roles to verify that because churches are really good at tracking how many people show up um, for a variety of reasons. Um, and what he found was that the religious fib by about half. Um, right, so when you look at what I call the Hansen factor, um, you see that um, that religious attendance or attendance at services is about the same between the religious and the non-religious. About 25 percent, 25 to 30 percent of people do something on a Sunday or Saturday or whatever day it is like this. Um, and that's actually pretty cons consistent with historical records. Even in the Middle Ages, uh, when people were required to go to church, uh, often they were penalized financially, often violently, um, there were certainly threats, they actually believed in a robust concept of hell, kind of, sorta. Um, about 25% of people actually showed up at church, and even those who showed up were fairly loose about it, in the sense that in a medieval Christian mass, um, and right before the elevation of the host, the priest, you know, the whole thing's in Latin, nobody's paying attention. Literally, people are in the church playing cards, uh, writing graffiti on the walls. If you go to medieval cathedrals, you can see this, you know, 11th century graffiti, or, or what I was just in Ireland over the summer, you see it all over, right? So the priest would go to the sexton, psst, bud, go to the pub and get everybody before um, before the host is elevated, because that's the part they needed to see, right? That's where we get the hocus pocus from, right? And the priest holds up the, the host and says, hoc es corpus, here is the body, right? And even then, lay people were like, hocus pocus, I get it. Um, so that's where we get that word. So we've had this thing since the 1950s for a lot of political reasons in the United States that really juiced up religious affiliation because it became tied with social and political forces at the time. But the fact of the matter is, in the long sweep of history, about 25% of people are active engagers in some kind of communal service on a regular basis. Um, prayer certainly a thing that uh, seems to be more appealing directly to the religiously affiliated, but a, a big slice of people who identify as religiously un unaffiliated also do practices that they identify as prayer, whether that's to a higher being or force or not. One of the people I interviewed was a former student who identifies as an atheist, was raised as a Catholic, he said, I just like that word, you know? <laughs> it's the word I was raised with. And it, it's, it's not capricious, actually, in that the word prayer in English is really one of the only words that we have to express the concept of hope and anxiety at the same time. So if someone is ill and you say, I'm thinking about you, it actually doesn't have the same valence as saying, I'm praying about you, which says, I'm worried about you, and I hope that you're okay. So the, the word itself is capacious. It has a lot of space in it. And there are a lot of non-religious people who are saying, no, I'm taking it. It works. It's in the language. I just, I'm not praying to anybody. You know, and I'm not just meditating. I'm doing something where I'm actively, cognitively affecting uh, concern for others or myself.
right? Um, lots of both of the affiliated and the unaffiliated um, meditate. Um, more recently, uh, uh, the Pew Forum, which does the uh, big bulk of this research, um, has started tracking when, to the extent to which people feel uh, peace and well-being or, or a sense of awe and wonder, and you can see that those, those numbers kind of track among the two groups. Um, and this is like the big one, this comes from a researcher at, at Boston University, Nancy Ammerman, who found that both the religiously affiliated and the religiously unaffiliated identify as more spiritual than religious in the same amount, right? And so what we're starting to see is that we've had this sort of container that we've called religion I'm going to talk about this in a little bit, that we tightly tied a certain kind of, of doctrinal or cognitive belief sets that actually might be masking um, a set of behaviors or practices that are consistent among all human cultures, but we haven't always called them religion, right? Um, so. I took some of this research and, and went a little further with it. I had done this survey uh, with about, uh, well, actually, um, I, I had done this survey. I was, wanted to test what people think of as spiritually significant pra practices. And um, I'm not a sociologist. I just have a survey monkey account. Um, so I went to a colleague who's a sociologist, and I said, "How do I do this? You know, so it's credible." And she said, "Well, you know, do put together your questions." I'd done some focus groups to identify the categories um, of practices. Um, she said, "You know, to put your questions together." send it out to about 10 people you know, 10 or 20 people you know, ask them to send it out to 10 or 20 people you don't know. If you get 100 back, we can test how good the questions are. So I did that over the weekend, got my little survey my account, sent it out, and I went away that week. I went to the beach or something like that um, for the weekend. I came back, I actually had to upgrade my SurveyMonkey account to the paid version um, because I'd gotten 1,160 responses um, from people. People really wanted to talk about what are spiritually significant practices for me. And it turned out that about uh, 20 to 30 percent, depending on identification, of those people uh, identified as religiously unaffiliated. So I had a pretty fair population. Um, and what I found was this. Again, the practices that people saw as spiritually significant between nuns and sums, the affiliated and the non-affiliated, were pretty consistently the same. Um, in fact, the, the main ones, the top of the list, what I call the four F's of contemporary spirituality, uh, family, friends, Fido, and food. Um, uh, enjoying time with family, spending time with family, spending time with friends, uh, sharing and preparing food, spending time with pets and other animals, were the same for both groups. Um, and what I'm not showing on here is the bottom of the list, which is, uh, was the things that are conventionally measured by Pew and Aris and Gallup and the General Social Survey, uh, attending worship, uh, reading sacred texts, uh, and praying, uh, only prayer uh, came, made it to the top of the list, the top uh, of the list. The other two, and again, about 20, 30 percent uh, in this were, who were non-religious, the rest are religious, and because of my cohort, they had a lot of churchy people in it. Um, bottom of the list, attending worship, reading sacred texts. Bottom of the list for both groups, right? So again, we're seeing this sort of robust sense of of practices rather than beliefs that are defining what the spiritual life is made of. And you'll see this big gap in the family. The uh, religiously affiliated are more likely to be um, married and to have children um, than are the unaffiliated because they're a little bit older. Um, and so it's not like they like their family better, they just can't get out of the house um, <laughs> as much, right? So it's their family, their dog a little bit, and Lord help them, they're praying, um, right, through that. We're seeing other things, too, that point to a shift in what religion or spirituality might be. So when we look at how much 
people spend time in different religions, what we're seeing is that picking an exclusive religious category and staying with it is becoming a thing of the past, both in the population in general and among, in this case, mainline Protestants. And you'd see the same uh, pattern in Catholics. And what we, what we see is that people are at least once in a while checking out another religious tradition. Or, and now this is an interesting thing, I've actually talked with the people of Pew about this. They don't ask about non-religious traditions. So we don't know, um, for example, how often somebody who mostly identifies as kind of, sort of, a Lutheran shows up at a humanist community meeting just to check it out. We don't know that, right? Um, and, you know, it might not be huge, but it's probably a little bit of the data, right? Um, now, part of this is just because our lives are intertwined, right? Um, we go to each other's weddings, we um, go to holiday meals, even if they're not our holidays. Um, we spend time together doing service work and all of those kinds of things. We don't live in small, isolated chimpanzee communities where throwing the rock at one particular tree is really the only game in town. So we learn a lot more about the, the diversity of religious and spiritual experience and that used to play out as battles about belief. Um, it's now playing out quite differently as engagement with different practices that are quite interesting to people often. So, one of the things that we're seeing in all of this is a shift from believing as the defining character of religious or spiritual identity. That is, you know, if you are a Buddhist, there are certain things that you believe. And we've assumed for a very long time, since about the Enlightenment, um, actually there's probably, there was like a Wednesday, Descartes sitting at his desk, you know, he utters the cogito, I think, um, therefore I am, and all of a sudden, everything becomes about what we believe. Right? Wasn't like that before. Um, before the Protestant Reformations um, in the West, almost nobody became a particular kind of religious because they had a strong belief. They became religious because the dude in charge felt like maybe the Christian God will give me an edge in battle, so I'm down with that, and y'all are mine, right? And I will either threaten to kill you or actually kill you if you're not on board, right? So religious belief came after that, right? Um, so in the Enlightenment, this idea of belief becomes the central thing that we focus on in religion, and that's what we argue about, right? But what we're finding now is that when people talk about things that are spiritually meaningful or religiously significant to them, they're talking about things that happen within the realm of human interactive experience that are sensate, that are relational, they're about how people connect to others, they're about what it feels like, what it tastes like, what it smells like, uh, how fun it is, right? So when you look, think back to those chimpan chimpanzees heaving stones at rocks, right? And if you, you can see the videos of these on YouTube, they, it's, there's glee. I mean, it's hard to not read, and like they just glee, you know, they throw, heave it, and you might have had that experience skipping stones or doing something like that where you have that sense of um, connection with nature or release or something like that. We would be hard pressed to figure out, even if we could speak to the chimpanzees, what they believe, right? We, we couldn't say they believe in this or that, but we've put it in that container, and so the the discussion between the religious and non-religious has been, is this rational or not, right? Well, I, there are few people within mainline, mainstream religion who really 
don't get, like there's a talking donkey in the Bible, right? Um, so there are few reasonable religious people that think, you know, that was probably a fact. There was, you know, I mean, there's the guy in Ohio with the museum, right? But, or Kentucky, wherever it is, uh, right? Um, but, you know, that's not really generally how religious, religious, religious people see it. Um, in the in the mainline mainstream religions, right? So that's one shift. Related to that is this idea that we're moving from rules that guide behaving um, from a sense of of very narrow rules and rituals to broader senses of practice um, and practice in particular around. Um, um, characteristic human uh, phenomena, like um, marking life transitions, right? Um, what, uh, you know, uh, we, people are born, they become adults, um, they form uh, committed relationships, they have children, um, they die, you know? And all of those people seek some kinds of practices that um, help them to understand what those experiences mean in their lives. We all have experiences of awe and wonder. We experience mystery, right? Just because something is mysterious to us doesn't mean that it will never be explainable, but it's interesting because it's mysterious, right? And we all have that sense of it. And what we're finding is that people are setting aside the idea just like the idea that you can have one belief set that works for everything, that there's one way of, of, of acknowledging and working through those life passages, and they're identifying lots of different practices that work. Um, likewise, we have tended to think of religious and spiritual uh, identity as being a fixed thing, right? So, uh, you know, I worry about this quite a lot. As I said when I came in, I sort of am culturally an Episcopalian. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I don't go to church, um, but I, I have. Sometimes more, sometimes not. Um, there's almost nothing in the creedal statements of, of Christianity, not, not nothing, but almost nothing, that I could identify as a factual statement that I could assent to, right? Um, so on the one hand, I'm not very much Episcopalian, but I do like Stilton cheese and port. Um, so there's that, and I can be very judgy. Um, so, so that, right, that's a part of my legacy. But we used to think you get that identity, and it, it, it's, it's etched on your soul, right, um, for religious people, and even for the non-religious. You know, non-religious people are constantly having debates about um, whether to call themselves humanists or secularists or um, atheists or agnostics is, or, you know, the whole, there's the whole, you know, Sunday assembly controversy around, you know, why are you rejecting atheism and th that kind of thing. What we're finding more and more is that you know, people recognize that life is long now, right? In a time, and this is really up to the early 1900s, where most people in this room, now pretty much everybody in this room, we'd all be dead. We'd all be dead for a while, right? People died in their 40s and 50s, right? So in that life, you know, life was short, difficult, often violent, even for the people who had it the best, right? In that light, you're not really shopping around for maybe a different spiritual or intellectual tradition. You're just doing your thing, you know, um, hoeing your row and getting on. Well, now we have these big, long lives. Many of us will live past 100 in this room, right? So to lock into some kind of religious or spiritual identity when you're six years old or three years old or at baptism and have that through life doesn't make sense for people. So more and more we're seeing that in a fluid, in a fluid kind of way. Um, finally, and I think this is really the most important characteristic that I'm seeing and it, it drives a lot of the rest, um, the sense of belonging that was associated with 
uh, a certain mode of believing, certain forms of behaving that shape identity, is shifting from a narrowly communitarian form where we're all together because we're the humanist community to a much more cosmopolitan form that engages the world not in its sameness but in its difference. Um, and that's really a defining feature of the, the culture in general right now. It's creating a lot of alarm for a lot of people in the world. Just ask Stephen Miller about that, um, right? Um, but it is really the reality of our time. Um, <clears throat> over the summer I was uh, teaching a religion in America class um, and the final unit was on how people identify religiously and what that means in America today. Um, and one of my students talked about her identification as a Catholic Hindu or a Hindu Catholic. And what it meant to her to have been raised as a Catholic, she encountered Hinduism as a college student, spent a lot of time studying with it, was attracted to a lot of the practices in both of those communities, but felt most authentically herself um, when she could pull them together. Um, and not, by the way, because they had compelling belief sets. Right? She disagreed with beliefs in both of them, but because who does not love that throne of the colored pow powder in the Holy Festival, right? And, you know, who does not like that big pageantry of um, a midnight mass at Christmas time? You know, there's, there's deep beauty there that was significant for her. She didn't want to give up either, but felt pushed to do that, to make a choice by this old mode of doing that. And many of the people that, that I interviewed for Choosing Our Religion um, talked about this pressure from both religious and non-religious communities to choose one path, one way, to ignore the obvious um, wisdom that's in the world around. I mean, there was a time when you could look at people who were religiously or non-religiously different, and because we were all in smaller community groups, you could kind of look over at them. You wouldn't see very many of them, right? But you'd just say, they must be crazy. But we now interact with enough people that we know they can't all be crazy, right? And we have to figure out ways to negotiate that. The, the oldest uh, person in my study was a guy named Jack. He just actually died uh, last year, but he was 83 when I interviewed him. And he had been fronting uh, as a Methodist for his whole life. Uh, his wife had died. He found an article that I'd written that his son, who's a Methodist pastor, lives in Kansas, lived in Kansas, um, uh, had been railing about something insane that I'd said um, and about the unaffiliated. And Jack emailed me and said, I'm an atheist. I'm in an agreement with my wife when we married that I would never tell anyone in my small community. And he said, uh, now she's gone, I'm at the end of my life and I've told a lie my whole life. Um, because there wasn't space in his world to have multiple identities together, right? To make sense of them in either a self or a, or a community or a family. And I think that's putting lots of pressure. My students worry about, you know, maybe I like hanging out with the Secular Student Alliance at San Jose State. We don't have one on our campus. Um, maybe I like doing that. But I also like going to a, a chanted uh, Tizé service. Um, with the Mercy nuns in Burlingame on a Thursday night. Can I do that? Is there space um, for that? And I think this move from communitarian to cosmopolitanism is one of the most significant of our time. Um, it's, I, I think if there are anything to be done 
uh, any, you know, the biggest priority, I think, for both religious and non-religious groups is to think about how to negotiate that shift um, in an institutional way. Uh, because one of the things that's happening, because institutions can't accommodate this, is institutions are dissolving. And we all feel that, right, um, in different ways, both religious and non-religious groups. Um, but certainly, there are profound implications um, for making this kind of shift, right? One way that people are contending with this is part of what I saw down the street. Let's build the wall higher, right? That's become literal for us in America in many ways, right? Literally the idea of building a wall to keep us safe from other identities, right? Um, so there's great power to overcome that, and the good news is that people are doing it themselves, right? Um, so we see, you know, among atheists that I interviewed, all the time, they were able to say, look, there's actual good stuff happening in religious communities and traditions, right? Do I believe that somebody was uh, tortured and executed on a cross and then reappeared in human form? No, I don't. But is that a powerful story of something happening in some way in the world? Yes, it is. Um, and we can make sense of that story without assenting to its truth claims, right? In the same way that we make sense of, you know, powerful myths from all kinds of cultures without necessarily assenting to their truth claims. And so it was surprising to me when I talked to non-religious people and asked them what are the most important models for you in your spiritual life, that they often brought up religious models. Um, they brought up lots of non-religious folk as well. Um, but they really admired when religious people were able to make change in the world without, again, having to accept that this was the only way to do it, um, was exclusive, or required some kind of belief-based assent um, to it. Now, this last slide gets a little tricky. Um, I've used this slide for a while, but in the last month, this has become very problematic uh, um, with this guy, right? But um, even, even the Pope has come to this place where he's recognizing, like, we have work together to do in a world that needs us to do it. So when I see, you know, on your table, the book, the, the book with opportunities for humanists to do all kinds of things, that coming together between the religious and non-religious around practice is really, I think, the opportunity for growth and change in the world in a moral sense, right? And it seems to me that, again, I'm not an evolutionary anthropologist, but it does seem to me that if there is something uh, innately spiritual um, in our species, it has to do not just with celebrating life transitions or, or um, expressing ecstasy, um, but also doing good in the world. I think that's something that we've cultivated, and I think it's something that the religious and non-religious um, can do together um, and is essential in these times. Um, and so I'm going to wrap up and let you ask questions. Hi, my name is Dave. I have a, a question I'd like to ask about um, the, the growth in what you say non-affiliated, mm -hmm. uh, institutionally non-affiliated, as opposed to those, the possible growth in those who actually uh, are giving up beliefs mm -hmm. totally, which does happen. Um, and I'm wondering whether the growth in the non-affiliated might have to do with, uh, for example, the scandals in the Catholic Church over the last mm -hmm. few decades that have come to light, 
or the exposed hypocrisy in the evangelical movement, you know, the Trump supporting, things mm -hmm. like that? Yeah, I'm, there's, so it's going to be different after the Pennsylvania report and um, Germany, um, recent, like the Catholic Church is imploding, right? So I don't know yet, but I'm real interested to see what my students are saying. Last year, um, what students were saying to me when they talked about why they became unaffiliated uh, or identified as unaffiliated um, what, had little to do with that because they were little in 2000 when the Boston report came out, so they didn't get to get pissed off about that until they saw that movie, right, that came out a couple years ago. So that was not in their cultural frame, right? Certainly the hypocrisy of some religious groups is something they're aware of. Um, the caricature of both religion and non-religion by competing groups is something they're aware of. But more often, it's that wherever some kind of organized thing is happening that is about religion or non-religion, it's not engaging to them because they don't feel it, right? <clears throat> Sitting in a room like this doesn't feel like much. And it doesn't feel any better if you put it in a Methodist church, right? So it really is about the practice of, of attending to um, your own sense of purpose and meaning, uh, what feels awe-inspiring, what feels like it gives you an opportunity to do good, all of those kinds of things. And so part of the, I think that the, this is a hard word, but failing uh, of both religious and non-religious groups is that we've stayed so much in our heads in this concept of belief and arguing about that, that we've forgotten the whole broad swath of human experience. So I would say in the long term, that's had more of an effect. It's, we're also living in the longest period in history, in human history, in the West, in which people could choose to be religious or non-religious without the threat of violence. And that is not a small deal, um, truly. The last big push we had on that was when Eisenhower says, it, to be American, you have to be religious. I don't care what kind. This is somebody who got baptized in the White House, just FYI. Um, but um, to be American, you have to be religious. It was associated with McCarthyism. To be atheist, um, you know, there was the whole ugly Madeline Murray O'Hare stuff. That moment juiced up uh, religious, all the suburban churches were built, all of those kinds of things. Before that, 25% about 25% were actively religious, went up to 70%. So I think we're seeing a correction on that that's just organic. Um, and, but I think that's going to be juiced up by um, this latest uh, round of scandal news from the Catholic Church. Hi. Back here. Where are you? Oh, okay. Hi. Um, I was uh, very encouraged by the emphasis you put on tolerance, especially at the end, because so many in the religious and atheist community tend to be so intolerant or didactic about what other people should be. So I, I was very encouraged by that trend that's emerging. So great. I, I don't know what you mean by religious exactly, but I know that latest Pew study said 40% of the people were either Protestant or Catholic, okay? Mm -hmm. And another 30% were the nons. But it said of that whole 70% and the nons, they tend, to me it's, religion is irrelevant, it's about values. And they tend to focus and practice Christian values. Yeah, I mean, the United, in the United States, I mean, we're culturally Christian, right? So whether you want to be or not, you've learned from television and books and your schools and all of those kinds of things, certain concepts of religious freedom, um, right? We teach kids about um, the pilgrims coming 
not for um, you know economic exploitation of, a, of another country, but for um, religious freedom. We don't talk about freedom from re religious religion, right? There were very few actual Puritans on that boat, right? Most of them were workers. They got in big trouble for not practicing religion, although they were happy to have freedom from religion, right? So we learn all of these kinds of things. We learn that in order to be, have a wedding, you need a minister, all of those kinds of things. So there are value systems that come with that, and certainly they track largely to, to Protestant Puritanism. Um, and so yes, those values will be the same. I will say, however, what I'm seeing is a shift from toleration Right? Um, I'm not just tolerating you sitting there. Um, to real engagement. So my student who sees herself as a Catholic Hindu, for example, really wants to know at the level of lived experience about both of those traditions and maybe more, right? Um, or no tradition at all, what that means, without fear. Right? And so we're, we're, you know, tolerance is about fear. Like, you could go off at any time, so I should, I don't know why I'm just pointing at you, I'm sorry. I'm sure you're very kind. Um, but you could go off at any time, so I just need to tolerate that this is how you do it, and maybe you won't, right? Tolerance comes from fear, actually. How do we manage our fear of others? We let them do their thing. Right? Real encounter, real cosmopolitanism comes from saying, I could learn from you, and I'm, I'm willing to take the risk of potentially being changed by you, as you with me, right? Now, we might come to a place where we just don't, and we go our separate ways, right? Um, but we're exchanging stories and knowledge and practice and all those kinds of things to the point that we enrich each other. Hi, um, over here. No, okay. Yeah, so I noticed you used cosmopolitan, you used uh, hybrid, you used Catholic Hindu, Hindu Catholic, mm. you used tolerant, you used all these expressions. I didn't hear the expression syncretic anywhere in there, and since most of the religions of the world actually do involve some kind of syncretism, I'm wondering why you did, chose not to look at that. Um, I, I'm not sure I consciously chose. <laughs> um, that, uh, except for this, now, wait, just do a little Freudian thing for a moment. Why am I avoiding that term? Because it's, uh, the, the term syncretic tends to be demeaned among the religious as a cheapening of, of religion, right? We know historically, of course, that that's how religions and non-religions develop by, you know, like humanism comes from the Christian tradition, right? Uh, right? So, so, th so that's kind of a thing, right? We know they get adapted. So, um, you know, if I'm avoiding the term, it's mostly that I work with religionists, and it tends to be a flag for people diluting the religious tradition by grabbing from other traditions, um, as opposed to really embracing lots of otherness and making, sometimes making new things of it and sometimes not. So, um, two things about... Um, I don't know where you are. Okay. <laughs> first of all, the, word, the Latin word of religion is binding people together mm -hmm. who believe something. Whatever. When you talked about the Catholic and Hindu, I was thinking about the celebrations you were talking about. And when I, I grew up in a secular home, although my mother's family, she wasn't, was somewhat Jewish, somewhat Protestant, and my father's not at all. And I remember hearing the Christmas carols and loving the music and the way the words work together but not believing any mm -hmm. of it. I went to college. I was briefly flirting with religion just to see what it was like mm -hmm. and then went away from it. I can still appreciate the music and the way the wor words together go together. And the, I've never gone to a midnight mass, but I've heard about it. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it, it's the everybody singing together mm -hmm even if not everybody believes everything together. Right. Yeah, you know, a really interesting thing happened while I was researching the book. So a lot of my research was funded um, by religious organizations, right, because they're desperate to, to um, the, among their favorite phrases are capturing the nuns, because everybody loves to be captured. Um, but so I went to a lot of conferences um, with religious groups. 
And an interesting thing started to happen um, as I was doing that. I went to a big conference of Lutheran musician, musicians, which was a crazy good time. Um, lots of beer. Um, anyway, and people would come up to me like, you know, in the hallway, on a break, in the restroom, or, or whatever, and say, you know what? I actually don't believe any of this. I just like being in the choir, <laughs> you know? It's, I mean, it's one of the last places, right? Churches are one of the last places that you can gather in a large group and sing songs that everybody knows, right? And that became a kind of thing. I'd go to academic, the you know, Academy of American Religion conference, and scholars who were, you know, were ordained pastors in different traditions would come to me and say, well, I haven't gone to church for like 15 years, you know, um, because I just can't stand it. You know, it's just stupid um, or whatever. But I like certain kinds of practices, so I do that. And I think that's the thing is, of course, um, in this is part of my Episcopalian tradition. If you go to any Episcopalian church, you'll see people... Um, mouthing different words, for example, to the Nicene Creed, right? Like a big popular one is referring to the Holy Spirit as she instead of he. So you can look around the congregation and people say, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, she, you know, whatever. So people haven't been always believing this for like forever, right? Um, but it felt like something. We know that um, there was research that came out a couple years ago that um, <clears throat> if students sing together before they take an exam, they actually do 10% better um, on the exam, right? I haven't been brave enough to do this with my students, but I, I, I always tell them this and tell them to go sing before class. We know singing does stuff, you know, to, our, um, to us cognitively and socially and biologically, right? So we just like it. We just like it. Right? Whether, you know, the King of Glory is coming, eh, not so much, but man, that has a beat, you know? It's a toe tap and knee slap and good time. Mike, I have the next question here. Uh, despite some of the beauties of religion, and I agree, I was a former Catholic who never could understand one thing thing this sermon was about when I was a kid, but uh, the thing that hor uh, horrifies me is the wars across the planet. Uh, no, how could anybody uh, ever th uh, think of being religious <coughs> that God's going to do you a favor when you're being carpet bombed? And so we continue to do this on the planet. So, but meanwhile, we teach on a minor scale, love and peace. Someone said uh, this is the most peace we've had on the planet in uh, forever, but even so, the, today's newspapers and news is full of killing people, mm -hmm. and uh, there's just no way you could buy religion if you looked at the big picture. I, I, I'm not sure that I agree with that. I mean, I think that it, it is absolutely true um, it is absolutely true that much violence has been undertaken in the name of religion, right? Um, th much good has also been undertaken in the name of religion, and I don't know quite how you weigh those out. Um, I, I think that, the, again, the problem that we get to is when we narrowly define what religion is, we're not looking at practices, right? So if you start to say, well, I mean, you know, uh, the, the Pope saying in the last year, you know, that you cannot be a person of Catholic conscience and support the death penalty. That was a big deal, right, for a church that has been since the fourth century articulating just war theory, um, you know, to say there, there actually is no just war, there is no just killing of, of prisoners. There's, there's not. That's a big deal. However, in this moment, right, in this moment, uh, you know, where we're looking again at thousands and thousands and thousands of children who have been systematically <laughs> abused um, by practicing religious clergy, clergy, not just in the Catholic Church, um, but in all kinds of religions. Um, you know, I was in Ireland uh, when the Pope was there, <laughs> which was ironic, um, <laughs> really. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> You know, and I, we were driving around, and uh, young people generally were really indifferent. Like, why is he even here, right? Um, but lots of people 
uh, over 40 were really angry right because they had lived through uh, you know a life of Ireland being the most Catholic country seeing itself as the most Catholic country in the world and finding out that children had been regularly abused and women had been put in these Madeleine laundries and made to work for churches who were literally stealing their babies and taking them out it's hard to countenance that right um, and you know so I, I'm not making an argument for religion. I'm for love, peace, and justice. And if you can do that within a religious community, rock on. But you better fix that other stuff um, and get on it. So I think that makes it tough. Um, I think there's uh, probably a lot of reasons why people are less religious today, but I'm wondering if a couple of them are uh, possibly one is that Kids today are becoming much more individualistic. We're an individualistic nation to begin with, but with the advent of the internet and with transportation so much more available, then that gives uh, people more of a choice as to the connections they're going to make, the activities they're going to get involved in. And in today's world, there's so many more activities that the church, which used to be a central focus of the community, mm -hmm is no longer that. Kids have the rock concerts and adults have plays and there's all sorts of street fairs and with Facebook and so forth few people are feeling a sense of connection even though it's a virtual connection mm -hmm. and that's a problem in itself but I think the increased individualism the increased tolerance of people who want to choose whatever beliefs they want and the fact that there are more choices as to how they're going to uh, satisfy this need for community and connection. So, do you think that those are some yeah, of the Yeah, they're, major they're not, um, you know, I, I would never argue that the internet has killed religion, which a lot of people think, but it does mean that people have access to information. Um, so, and, and more importantly than information, it has to do with connection, because certainly, especially among the non religious, right, it used to be if you were my friend Jack in, in um, Overland Park, Kansas, you were like the secret atheist guy. He couldn't go on the internet and find 200 other atheists around the country with whom to have conversation until he was in his 70s, you know? So certainly people are connecting in that way. They're finding information. You look at, you know, um, you know, if you, if you just go in and say uh, former Catholics or former Mormons or former evangelicals or what, I mean, there's all of these discussion boards and websites and whatever where people are are unloading their religious baggage, right, and connecting in other ways. So certainly that's happening. Um, I, you know, I think every generation gets accused of being more individualistic. Like literally, that was happening in the second century. You know, um, so that people are doing that. So I don't know that. I mean, the United States is a fairly has a certain individualistic idea, um, but I think people are connecting in new ways. The way they do it is not in this kind kind of space anymore. They don't connect in this with the same kind of durability that they had. And you know, until the 1900s, the majority of Americans never tra traveled more than 40 miles away from their home. You know, I'm originally from Pennsylvania. You know, I've been out here for about 20 years. Um, it, that's a big deal that we can move around and see all kinds of different things. And it does make it harder and harder to say, you know, my grandmother was Catholic and we would drive her to church on Sunday and if we went past the Lutheran church and they were walking in, I think they started half an hour early, and she'd say, oh, those poor people. I don't know why they just don't sleep in. They're going to hell. They might as well sleep in, right? So, um, she was a sweetheart, Nana. Um, but, you know, you just, it's not possible to live in a world where people, especially in a place like this, you know, this is one of the most religiously diverse places is in the world right here to see people and say you just have to be a full-on nutter to think what you think you might think I don't believe that I see it differently but to actually think you're going to hell that takes some cognitive boundarying that is 
pretty robust, <laughs> um, I think. So I think it's lots of factors, um, but certainly access to information and ability to connect with others who are like and unlike you is a big deal. Yes. Yeah, I don't know if it was mentioned this morning here, perhaps I missed it, but did we mention that some people join religious groups for financial advantage, you know? They make uh, commercial relations and recommend each other, mm -hmm. so uh, is that important or not? Yeah, it is. Well, it's important in lots of different ways. Um, so, you know, when we think about the things that in the West, religion, primarily uh, Christianity, used to do. So it used to be, on Sunday, um, the reason y'all did announcements up here, right, that's a, a liturgical practice um, that comes, sorry, that comes from the, uh, the, the ancient church, right, because that's where you got your news, right, so you got your news there, you got your education there, you got your health care there, and you did all your economic networking there, right? That's what's actually made Mormonism so strong, is they retain that model, right? People will help you find jobs, they will help you build businesses, they'll help you get recommendations for things, all of those kinds of things. And then we have on the evangelical side, the prosperity gospel, which not only says we'll help you, but God will help you, right, if you pray in the right way. So all of this, this is Durkheim's theory of religion, right, all of these things create a social structure that makes religion advantageous right for people and as that's falling away it's like I get my news on the internet you know I have friends from school I do all this I get my health care at Kaiser I'm good right so that's a big part of it 